There's something I would like to do this morning, and that's to invite you to stand with me as we read God's Word. Nick said we should be participatory. They started this back in the book of Nehemiah, and it's probably not a bad practice. We're going to look at 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing in his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather them around a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you, keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. Fathers, we look at this passage today and how it affects us today, 2,000 years later. By your Holy Spirit, would you, as Jesus prayed in John 17, guide us into all truth, that we would understand the intent of these words, what was said, and, and how you want us to participate in them, not just today, but during the week in your future lives. And, and so we, we give this time to you. We acknowledge that your word is true. We believe it, we hold firm to it, and we know that in it, it holds the way to salvation, to life, abundance in you in relationship and in eternity. Thank you, Father, in your name, amen. You may be seated. Which includes me, because I'm kind of hurting, so. Some, many of you have asked, how's the ticker? I'm doing really well. I wish my back was doing as well as my heart, but uh, it's okay. Have you ever been pouring your heart out to somebody about something that you believed in, you were passionate about, and you get done and there's that pause, and you're waiting for an answer, you're waiting for a buy-in, and instead what you get is, well, I have my own truth or whatever, or I'm glad that works for you, but it just, it, it, it's not where I am. I don't know about you, but that word whatever, something happens in my heart that makes me want to slap somebody. <laughs> you know, it's just like, whatever. And many people think that there's been a shift recently into the self-glorification of man. You well, know, that's been around since sin. That's the essence of sin, is to glorify man instead of God, to each find our own way, to each find something that is significant to us. And, and if you know the truth, and you know that the truth is going to set somebody free, it's really going to help them, and yet that's what you get, it's really frustrating. And somehow or another, Paul understood that way back when, and, and he, he's winding up his second letter to Timothy. And it's obvious that he has great love for Timothy, that he's, he wants to mentor this young man into his own footsteps as he proclaims Christ and travels and, and shares the good news. And so he brings up the topic of people finding their own way and how frustrating that is and it's alluring. How many of you have a favorite uh, news station or a favorite blog or a favorite website that you think is honest and, and true? But what's it honest and true to? More than likely, it's honest and true to the way that you believe. And we have so many options. And Paul says, this is so important, I'm gonna lay a foundation first for you. In the presence of God and of Jesus, I'm saying these things to you. He's aware that there's no greater foundation, there's no greater level of authority than he can speak into or out of. 
And so he says, in the presence of God and of Jesus, I'm going to share these things with you. But I also want to, you to understand that these things are also based on the authority of Christ's near return, where he's going to judge the living and the dead. Now, right there for a lot of people, mm, I don't think that's going to happen. And so we back away from it, and we find something that tickles our ears. We find something that, you know, is Christ really going to return? I mean, they were talking about that 2,000 years ago. Seriously? I think it must be something else. I think it must have just been motivational talk for them to get the message across, to get somebody to believe in it. But he goes on and he says, the coming of King Jesus as the head of that kingdom. And finally, he says, in the certainty of the reign of Christ in that kingdom. And so he starts off the passage with these four things. It's based on God's presence. That's our present reality. It's based on the fact that in our present reality, Christ came to rescue, to provide a pathway out of sin. And then there's a future reality that he speaks to where Christ is judge, where he's present physically again, and he's king over his reign. These are his last words. They're not Paul's last words, but they're the last words formally to this young man. And he wants him to know with great authority what he's getting into. A new clicker, and I'm going backwards. And he says these things. He says, preach the word in season and out of season. Be prepared for those times when you have an agenda, when you have a strategy. But when you don't have a strategy, be prepared as well. Those off-the-cuff conversations. One of the things that's interesting to me is that people want to learn how to have a spiritual conversation. That's a foreign concept to me because I grew up in a home where 70% of the conversations we had were spiritual. And if we went to grandpa's house, to nana and papa's house, it was spiritual. And there wasn't a period of life where Jesus wasn't part of the conversation or the Bible wasn't a part of the conversation or something we were reminded that the Bible said to do. And so to have a spiritual conversation was just to live life, recognizing that as Paul started out, God's presence is here. The work of Jesus has been accomplished and the Holy Spirit bears witness to that in our hearts and souls on a continual basis, not when we just think of it, but it's a fact of my life. It's a fact of your life, regardless of how cognizant of it you are. I remember Papa, he was a preacher for 50 years, and he didn't start out a holy guy. When he was 20, he was a logger. He was a tough guy. In fact, when he walked into a bar one night, he uh, saw my grandma sitting there. She was a beautiful lady in her younger days. And she was with a guy, but that didn't stop Papa. He went over to him and said, uh, I'd like you to go home with me. Not knowing that the younger guy was also her fiance. The fiance stood up, Papa looked at him, knocked him out, they left, and three weeks later they were married. And so that was the beginning of this guy's life, but Jesus got a hold of him and he realized that the authority was not his word, his will, it was God's. And it wasn't too long later that he became a horse and buggy preacher and preached the word in seven communities around Northeast uh, Washington, Northwest Washington. And over the years, when I knew him, he was the pastor of Darrington First Assembly of God, a little 100-person logging town church. And one of Papa's favorite uh, sermons had to do with Christ coming back. 
it seemed to me as a, as a kid, that's all the man talked about, was the return of Jesus and what that meant and how good it was going to be. And if you look at Paul's teaching, in every book, in every letter, he brings up the fact that Jesus is returning, that Jesus is coming back, and that's purpose and motivation for living. And I thought Papa would just, he needed to get a new topic. But at the same time, there was an attraction to him because when you think of the return of Christ, there's hope, there's promise, there's authority in that. He came out of surgery, he had cancer, and he was so full when they opened him up, they just sewed him back up and told the family it would be soon. I happened to be, my brother and I were in his hospital room when he, when he woke up. And he looked around and he began to weep. And he said, I'm back. I said, where were you? He said, I was, I was ready to go into heaven. And it was so good. I was looking forward to seeing Jesus. And he wept for what seemed like a long time. Not because of pain, not because of his condition, but because he wanted to see Jesus. And that was a motivation that, that drove him as a pastor. When I did his funeral, three, four weeks later, in this little logging town, it was the first time they had shut down the woods in 50 years. And for a mile either direction, there were logging trucks parked and people coming in. There were about 400 people trying to get into a church that sat 125 people. And I went around afterwards talking to them, and I said, why are you here? I knew they didn't come to church every week because I was there and they weren't. And they said, because your papa had something special about him that brought hope. And when I was sick or my little girl was in the hospital or my wife was doing this, your grandpa was there. And he always talked about the hope and he lived with hope and he was attractive because of that hope. And Paul seems to hammer this home because he knows how important of a fact that is to us Christians, that we have hope. We have hope not only for today, but hope for eternity. And in setting that as a, as a base, he says, based upon that, Timothy, preach the word. Now, Later, he says to Timothy, do the work of the evangelist. So he's not saying he's an evangelist. He's a, a young guy going into ministry. And probably just like you or me, he had occasion to speak to a group of people. But also just like you and me, he was around people daily. Handling the word of God in truth is a responsibility that each of us have. In talking about giving, I've heard people say, well, I don't have the gift of giving. No, but you do have the responsibility when the plate comes by to give. As a family member of the kingdom of God and of, of the church you're participating in. Evangelism's much like that. You may not have the gift of giving, but we each have the responsibility to be ready in season and out of season because of the hope we have. And that hope we have is not only the presence of Jesus now, but it's the reality of a kingdom coming that we'll get to live in as followers of Christ. And yet, as I listen, we don't talk about that much. We're very much about right now. We're very much about the moment. And yet, Paul states his final commands to this young man based on what's coming, on an eternity that Christ will be king of, where Christ will be present, that will begin with the judgment of the living and of the dead. But for those of, that follow Jesus, there's great hope and there's great promise. After he says, preach the word, he uses three words. He says, be willing to use the word to correct people. That speaks to the intellect. Be willing to rebuke people. That speaks to the will. 
and be ready to encourage people. And that, that speaks to, or the rebuke speaks to, um, I'm sorry, I said, well, it speaks to the conscience and, and to encourage somebody speaks to the will to do something. But notice after he says, preach the word, and he says these things, he shifts gears and he says, but do it carefully. Do it gently. Do it with great instruction. Truth can be harsh. Truth can carry with it a, a wallop. It can set somebody back. It's not meant to. Anytime we share the truth, even though it may have severe consequences, it's part of God's bringing us to freedom. It's part of God bringing us to a place of knowing him more. It's, it's part of bringing us to clarity on how God wants us to live. And that's so important. Anytime you're using God's word, the outcome should be the result of somebody living closer or understanding Christ better, not just feeling beat up. I've known people that use the word really well as a baseball bat. And there was nothing living, there was nothing of hope in it at all. It was just harsh. And he says, no, deliver with great patience and with clear understanding. In disciplining our children, there's a difference between discipline and punishment. Discipline brings about clarity and future behavior, and it always ends with affirmation. Punishment focuses on past behavior and simply what you deserve. And that's not God's way. God's way is to encourage, to lift up, to bring truth. We never, and Paul never shies back from correcting. He never shies back from rebuking, but it never leaves the person in want or in need or discouraged. It always leaves the person with hope. One of the things that Paul then shifts to is he says, why I'm telling you this, Timothy, is because already in our day, there are people who are shifting from sound teaching to what they want to hear. Now, today we have fake news. We have just a variety of things that we can choose. You know, when blogs came on, there are just a small number of them. Now there's a plethora of blogs that you can choose. And you can get anybody who is quote unquote smart to agree with what you think. And we've gotten really sophisticated at glorifying ourselves. It's interesting. There's a, uh, Barna did a study, I don't know if you can read that there, but I'll, I'll go down it. The question was, in 2017, where do people get their wisdom? Where do they get the truth? 39% said a reporter. 32% no, nobody. I trust my own instincts. 27%, a family, friend, member, or a peer. 22, a famous academic. 14, a pastor I personally know. 12, a teacher I personally know. 7%, a politician. 6%, a famous pastor. 6%, a celebrity. Ten percent of people under 18 today, whether you're in the church or not, they say believes that the Bible is absolute truth. Ten percent. When I read that, I didn't believe it, so I, I went looking for other sources to hopefully change the reality of that statement. And, and it ranged between 10 and 15 percent. 
And then we wonder why we have issues with education, with parenting, with kids just running amok with the law. And that's when I remembered back what our household conversations were like growing up. And what we tried to have our conversations about when our girls were growing up. Truth was the language that was spoken, not because it was our opinion, but because it was based on God's word. I want to encourage you this week to try something. Pay attention. Pay attention to what your language and your topics are in your household. Whether you're single living next, by yourself, what are you listening to? What's, what's coming in? If you're a parent or a roommate, what do you guys talk about? Is the topic have anything to do with truth? If it does, then you're having those spiritual conversations around God's Word. And, and what you do is so critical. This is the, apparently the marriage season. COVID's been good for weddings. And out of this church, last um, mid-March, April and May for eight weeks, um, I led a class for uh, almost engaged, engaged and newly married. We had 29 couples in it. We did it all online. It wasn't fun. I don't want to do that again. But it was so gratifying to see 29 couples caring about what the Bible said about what their life should be as a married couple. And everything we talked about was biblically based, out of God's Word. In March or eight, uh, September 20th, Estelle and I start another class with five new couples. We start another one in January. We've already got people, couples signing up for that. And we've got weddings being scheduled next June and August. And, and it's encouraging because what I'm seeing is, is not people that are wanting to get married for the wrong reasons. They're wanting to get married to each other because of godliness. They're wanting to get married to each other because it's right in God's eyes that they should live that way. And, and it's encouraging. And the things they want to talk about when they come over are not how we do things, but how we navigate what God has said to navigate inside of marriage. And it's absolutely been delightful and so encouraging that outside we hear all the terrible things that are happening but in the church, we're hearing a desire to follow God's way, to think about his word and what it says to each of us. Truth seems to be something that people regard with their feelings instead of what's truly real. Even as, as Nick preaches many times, it, the word might be a little bit hard to stomach because it calls for change. And why would we change? We like the way we live. Why get married? It can be cumbersome. Why not just live until I find somebody better? What is it about truth that spurns on a good life? Pay attention to yourself and what rises up when you don't want to do something but is good for you. Is it easy to give in to truth, to be shaped by the Holy Spirit? Or do you want to hear something that tickles your ear? Recognize when your friends have a different opinion that they're just being what Paul said they would be as people who don't know Christ. Now, hopefully those who do know Christ are bound for truth as well. I found myself when I was younger getting upset at people who sinned until I realized they were sinners. That's the only option. I can't expect somebody that doesn't know Christ, that doesn't know the truth, to behave ethically, to love singularly, 
to be self-sacrificial, that's not human. They have to live self-serving because it's the only way. And, and Paul is saying people are going to live that way to such an extreme that will, it will seem as if truth has become a myth to the masses instead of them turning to myths and truth remaining the truth. And that really is what's happened. And he says, but you, Timothy, but you, church, keep your head about you in all situations. Don't follow the crowd. Don't get caught up in, in the sea of opinions. Stay true to the word. And that's more important today than ever as communication and news and a variety of things. You have so much to choose from. And so much of it is wrong. And so much of it doesn't matter. Listen to who you quote. If you're not quoting the Bible, get back into it. Even if you're quoting Nick, get back into the Bible. Nick can't get you into heaven. But God can. It's good to read stuff that's about truth and brings understanding, but you have to read the truth. You have to read the Bible. It has to be the food that, you are, that sustains you. I want to take um, a few moments. I think I've got eight left. And, and share something um, that's dear to my heart, but maybe for a different reason than you might think. And it's something that you know, Pastor Nick and Pastor Tom Flaherty over at City Church and Pastor Marcio Sierra at Lighthouse have agreed with that this is something that is important. It's Impact Christian Schools. I'll refer to it as ICS. You might think that just because the condition of our education, especially when it comes to minorities, that that's why we want to launch new schools. And it honestly has something to do with it. But for me, it has very little to do with it. One of the things that I have been convinced of in my own life is that I was called to do the work of an evangelist. I've never been an evangelist. I'm not an evangelist. And honestly, I never want to be because those are the people that just can't help themselves of sharing Christ and bringing people to Christ. And I've worked with them, I've trained them, but it's not who I am. I want my witness just to flow out of life and the things I'm passionate about. Diane Cook, who was a principal here at High Point Church School, High Point Christian School, and, and she had this wonderful relationship with ALCS and a beginning relationship with Lighthouse. And that was a number of years ago. When I got here five years ago, she was talking about this working relationship between the three schools and how it was bettering the schools. And it was based on the trust of the three primary pastors. I got to know those three and became friends with those three. But the trust was amongst those three. And She was looking at it for a lot of wonderful reasons, but then something else happened. She became a grandmother, and, and time got a little divided. And it began to grow in, in our thoughts that could this be more than just a relationship between the three schools? Could God be actually demonstrating that three different churches, very unique from each other, three different pastors, very unique from each other, but around the same truth of God's word, could work together in such a way that there could be progress outside of the church in an entity in education. And, and that really intrigued me, and I began to pray into it. And about that time, we hired Dr. Charles Moore, who's uh, now the principal at High Point Christian School. And as I got to know him, I found out that he had a vast background in the Wisconsin Family Choice Program and had worked with Lumen Schools in Milwaukee and Northwest Military Academy in the area's academics. And, and he knew all the people and all the players that we would need 
if we were to do something like ICS. Now, Chuck is a wonderful disciple. He truly loves Jesus. He was, uh, he went to Madison here for his undergrad and his master's and his PhD. He was a part of uh, Navigators. He loves to quote scripture. He loves the word. But he's, his degrees are in education. And I think education is critical. But I also know that education is an opportunity because in any classroom you have children of various ethnic backgrounds, of social, economic backgrounds, of various uh, religions. And there's kind of a flat playing field around the, air, the thought of education. Now, there's been a difference in how education happens in our country, and we believe that education can be and should be God-honoring. We believe that discipline is something that is godly. We believe that character development matters. In, along, in that environment, good learning can happen. And so we want to pursue excellence in education, but we also want to pursue excellence in the conversation about Jesus, in using it as, a, as an opportunity to speak into families. One of the things that, that we want to do with ICS that particularly is, is heavy on my heart is create new, I call them vision schools because they don't exist at the moment. Four new schools in the next seven, eight years that have a church tied to them. So right now we're looking at a building on the Beltline. There's a church that meets in that building. My hope is that that church, eight to 10 years down the road, owns that building because of the finances that ICS can come in and place a school there, pay the rent, eventually a mortgage, so that that church can be a permanent place in a neighborhood that that pastor, who happens to be African, where he has a place that's permanent, where his neighborhood sees him as a permanent part of that neighborhood, cares for them, and loves them. Now, I want that pastor to pastor the families of that school. I want to build trust with the families of, those, of that school in such a way that they can see that Christian isn't a terrible word, it's an inviting word that means those people love my student, those people care about my student, those people want my student to excel and to grow, not only academically, but as a whole person. And the wholeness of that person is also in Christ Jesus. I want them to see a brand of Christianity that's real, that's holistic, that doesn't just care about their soul, but cares about where they're at economically, that cares where they're at socially. I want to pour enough water into the lake of those students that all the households rise. And academics are important. Lighthouse has been doing this now for 10, 11 years. And, and they have just done it with blood, sweat, and tears, and prayer. And they've done an amazing job. When Vice President Pence was here uh, this last winter, he highlighted a story about a little boy he named Hector. It wasn't his real name. And the whole Lighthouse School, or at least the, I think the upper grades were on the platform with him at the, at the Capitol. And he highlighted the educational advances of this little boy who was way below reading and writing and math grades for his grade level. And in one year, he came up. Lighthouse has been, with the same students that are failing in public school, Lighthouse has been in the top five schools in the last three or four years in reading and writing and math in grades three and four for minority children. Some of you, yeah. And if, if you ask Marcio or Tia, Tia is the principal, Marcio's wife, why? It's not because we have amazing teaching methods. 
It's because Jesus Christ resides within the hearts and lives of every teacher, and they love the student, and they care about that grade, but they care about the grade because it's part of that person, it's part of that child. My hope for Impact Christian Schools is this, that in seven or eight years, we will have seen several thousand students plus their families who have a better opportunity in education, who have had the opportunity to meet Jesus, who have had the opportunity to know the value of his word, who have had the opportunity to be discipled, have the opportunity to know they have a future and a hope, and that their families trust the church. And their families have had those same opportunities as those children have had. When I got here five years ago, I told Nick that I don't know when or where or how, but God's given me a number of 20,000 people that we'll get to see come to Christ. Now, I don't know how that's going to happen. I really don't. And ICS can't accomplish that number in the next seven, eight years. We've got millions of dollars to raise. Yes, Drexel and a few other foundations are, are being generous. But the point isn't that we change education. The point is that the church brings opportunity, well thought out, sustainable, profitable, not in terms of finance, but in, in life growth that we cross racial divide, dividing lines. One day, Marcio said to me, he said, Mike, I know your heart. I know you love us. But honestly, many people in our church just still think you're part of the rich white church. That hurt, because that's not who we are. We're people who love Jesus. We're people who love them in whatever state them is, whether it's your coworker at work, whether it's your neighbor, whether it's people you've never met but have the opportunity to assist or work with. We are called to do the work of the evangelist, to preach the word in such a way that it's winsome, that it's holistic, that it's caring, that it's not judging that it draws people into the reality of Christ. Doing the work of evangelism, one of the things I learned in my 11 years at Billy Graham is it is a lot of work. Those of us that were in the traveling side of the ministry, there were only maybe 50, 75 of us. The other 500 people in the building just supported us because it took a lot of work. It took a lot of money. It took a lot of time. It took a lot of resources. But the end result was that people heard who Christ was. And I don't want that to be just the end result. I want people in this city to trust you because you're a Christian, to love them in a way that has not yet been seen in this city. Amen. I don't want to see racial divide in the church. If different races want to worship together, that's fine. But they are our brothers and sisters in Christ. And we're going to live together with them in such a way that confounds the media, that confounds education, that confounds employers, confounds law enforcement, because we are his church. Amen. And we have to do the hard work of the evangelist. That means preparing the soil, spending the money, knowing the crowd, being strategic about it, but then delivering with clear conscience, with gentleness, with great creativity, and with great care. The loving, forgiving, freeing word of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so, yeah, we're three years into ICS, 
and we still don't have a new school. But it looks like we may have one next August. And it will be a lot of work, and there will be a lot of people looking at it, but all they want them to see is Jesus. And I want to ask you one question. What are you doing in your life, deliberately, to do the work of the evangelist? What are you doing? Who are you deliberately meeting? How are you deliberately positioning yourself in life so that the people around you see Jesus? And when they see Jesus, who will they think he is because of you? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I am so grateful that we live in a present reality of your presence and the work of Jesus. I am so grateful that it's not a myth, that what people turn to is the myth, but that we stand on truth, something that is absolute, something that brings hope not in a whimsical way, but is foundational. Father, I pray that we, as your people, will discover the things that we need to do to deliberately do the work of the evangelist and that your name would be known. We love you, we thank you, and it's an honor to be called your church. Thank you for this passage, and may it live in our lives, Father, as truth. In Jesus' name, amen.